world. I'm your host, Peggy Ann Saltz, and my awesome co-host, Brian Baglow. Well, he isn't here with me today because he is prepping for Scottish Games Week, which is kicking off October 30th, and you're going to hear a lot more about that going forward. So he isn't here, and I could say, well, I feel a little bummed, but actually, no, I'm feeling great because I'm excited to break new ground. We love to do that here on PG.biz. And it reminds me a little bit of what Brian Balfour said a while back at Reforge. He said, all benchmarks are bogus. Well, maybe we can apply that here because maybe forecasting is BS. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's the point. We're going to be talking about it because Forecasting is, of course, all about the data that you need to make decisions about your game. So to help you make the right choices and, above all, data-informed decisions, we have two very different perspectives from two very different ends of the spectrum. So we're going to welcome today to PG.biz, Angus Lovett. He's ex-VP of Marketing at King, now co-founder at Ramp, a company on the cutting edge of forecasting. And we have Hong Nguyen, CFO at Space Games. Hello, Hong, a company on a mission to make the best mobile games. So first of all, great to have you. You're united by a love of doing data right. And you're also united by Australian roots. So I am going to strap myself in, I think, for what's going to be kind of edgy and unfiltered discussion indeed. How's it going? You all right? <laughs> looking, looking forward to it. Yeah. And I love a cricket. So um, I think we've been expats for quite some time, yeah. so our accents may not be as broad. A little as bit more, more mellow, I think. Than <laughs> mellow, yeah, average, mellow, yeah. Now, Angus, you are a champion of fundamental change in how studios approach forecasting. Let's start off with that. How do you define forecasting, and why do you think it's ripe for a rethink? Look, I, <clears throat> forecasting, like you said in your intro, it's, it's really about you know predicting the performance of a game or an entire studio in order to make uh, better business decisions, right? But fundamentally, it's a process of alignment. You know, it's alignment of resources to the size of the opportunity, you know, whether that's people or time or marketing money or, or what have you. And it's about alignment of people and teams, you know, internal and external expectation setting, getting teams to own the overall revenue targets uh, and aligning on the KPIs that are going to get us there. You know, as a marketer, I'm, by trade, I'm pretty passionate about this topic, but it mostly stems from the fact that, you know, I've worked for a bunch of different gaming companies over the years. And, you know, uh, and like in most companies, bad decisions are, are made at the top and shit rolls downhill, right? You know, what frustrates me is a lot of these bad decisions could have been prevented by leveraging the absolute mountain of data that we sit on as game developers or people working in the game development uh, industry. And, and so not nearly enough care and effort typically is put into the actual forecasting process at the forecast and the forecasting process itself, given how large the consequences are for getting it wrong, right? So the majority of times when I see like targets not getting hit, when budget's missing, right? isn't necessarily about poor execution, right? It's, a, it, it's usually down to poor forecasting. You know, it's, it's green lighting a game you shouldn't or kill, not killing a game fast enough. You know, and they're the things that can really get you in, into trouble, right? And, and if we're honest with ourselves, you know, if we just down our homework better with the data we already have at the time, we probably should have known better. And that's what really has frustrated me, I guess, and what I set out on a mission to try and do and expose and, um, you know, and that's why I, I found a ramp, which is effectively a, a, a startup that does granular cohort-based forecasting. We work with, with game studios, uh, venture and private equity, and uh, effectively we help do the homework to help with this better decision making. You talk about what the outcomes can be, Angus, but we're talking about this now. Is there something about where we are now in the gaming industry that makes this more important, more valuable? You know, as, as the gaming in, industry matures, I think, you know, I think finance for by and large knows what good looks like when it comes to forecasting and forecasting process. But the problem is, is they lack the, the tools. What happens as a result is that manifests in, in some pretty bad practices. And I kind of, 
jokingly put these bad practices in, 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 into buckets. Like we talk about the eyeballer method where people are like, okay, we're drawing a linear line from one point to another. It's like, okay, we made a hundred bucks yesterday. We're going to make 110 wire because you know, no reason. That's just a, a trend line we're, we're drawing through points or the boss man method where the CEO or some other one comes in and says, okay, we need to be hitting this target because that's why our best is a, a begging for us to hit. So you must make it. And of course there's no rhyme or reason you miss the target and then people get demoralized, right? Or the shit roll up method, right? This is the one where finance teams completely absolve themselves of the responsibility and they're like to the games teams in this, in this case, it's like, okay, well, you know, this games teams, you know, and they might underestimate, uh, you know, if they want to hit their bonuses or they might overestimate if they're bullish and they want to get a game <laughs> green lit. And, and what you do is you take all these crappy forecasts and you roll them all up into one big shitty forecast. <laughs> we call that the shit, the shit, the shit roll up. Um, I could swear on here, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think we have very much content know, otherwise. Yeah, and yeah, and so basically that they're the bad practices I see, and, you know, instead of what a good starting point is a bottom up. Um, you know, uh, forecasting process based on robust data science. So Hong Angus, obviously long time veteran in games companies. You currently a CFO at Space Ape Games, and he's talking about the way tr forecasting has done, been done traditionally uh, by finance people, people like you. Um, what are your thoughts? I think a couple of things I think for, for me to add, I think firstly around top down and the you know the big boss man or the founders you know like perspective they've got a lot on their plate and the last thing they want to be doing is getting in the weeds of forecasting but it's completely understandable that they do just because forecasting is so fundamental to your runway and strategic planning and decisions you make through your company um, i think the point here is for founders to trust their finance teams that they can get good forecasting out of them but then it, it's, it's kind of not rocket science, really. Like, uh, you know, to Angus's point, you know, you know, it's just really based on good forecasting is based on good assumptions, which means a bottoms up approach is, is kind of required. Um, because what that means is you, you kind of have a granular model that you can iterate very quickly on and it can take into account a whole lot of different variables. So it's it kind of it's very obvious. And yet sometimes it's kind of this first fundamental step is kind of missed just on the point around why forecasting is right for a rethink now is making a hit game is extremely hard and it's not a precise science. So the second thing is it's extremely data driven. So you kind of get this two points kind of crossing over and yet there is no innovation in uh, financial forecasting because, you know, in some other industries, you kind of don't need to, but in this one, you kind of have to, it's so data driven. So like for me, coming into gaming sort of, you know, five years ago, uh, that's the one thing I kind of uh, see as a gap, I, I, I would say. Um, and, and to be honest, it kind of might be okay that there's been no innovation beyond the spreadsheet for the last 20 years. But in gaming, I think, you know, it's at a point where you kind of have to, to differentiate yourself as a finance team. That's a great point. You know, games have moved on. We have different genres, different subgenres. You know, we just had Data AI recently on the show talking about these new opportunities bubbling up under the radar because there's a lot going on and there's a lot of innovation, but that's not happening in forecasting. Angus, why is that? Why is it not happening in forecasting? I think it's, it's like, you know, just say in this industry, we're, we're game developers right we we make games it's not our job to you know push the boundaries on, on on forecasting and and usually you know people like myself in marketing or maybe hong in finance you know we're the last in line for additional resources right like we're not going to get a team of developers to be working on our specific uh problems and that's kind of understandable you've got priorities right you know uh, number priority number one is to make a, a hit game that that that, that people love um, and so I totally get that, you know, and it's not just a gaming industry thing. I mean, this is a you know, worldwide thing, you know, 99% of people are still stuck in Excel, right? You know, or spreadsheets to do this forecasting work where, you know, quite clearly we all have the data sitting to do a much better job to make, you know, this real time connected models, which would vastly improve what we, what we do. Um, but that just not 
happening right now. You know, Hong, you've been doing this for 20 years, you know, across accounting, finance, both senior positions, general management roles. You've seen this happening across media, entertainment before coming to games. Now, Angus here, he is talking about how forecasting is done, what can happen when it's done poorly or badly, and that's what does happen. Um, this is what also happens when you have junior people who don't have a clue, you know, they're just sort of inputting data. What's, what's your experience? What have you seen about the inputs? Because the inputs, when they are not right, then the outcomes are also just as bad. Yeah, absolutely, Peggy. Uh, the stories I could tell you <laughs> but, uh, for another day. <laughs> I worked for a lot of startups in Silicon Valley, New York, you know, San Fran, you name it, mm -hmm. LA. Um, uh, the question kind of takes me back to uh, a time when I was running forecasting at MySpace. So uh, I'm not sure if anyone's old enough, but it was when uh, MySpace was the number one social network. Uh, just don't ask me about how it ended. <laughs> I was running regional teams doing forecasting. To your point, uh, you know, Peggy, I've, I've worked across lots of different industries, across a lot of tech. Uh, the reality is, you know, at Tangus's point, the stakes are extremely high. Um, you know, it's not about one person, one bad FP&A person getting fired. It's literally about teams and companies going bust and being sold because of bad forecasting. And I've had some personal experience there as well. Like the consequences of getting it wrong are quite significant. And, and sadly, like a lot of companies don't really kind of really place forecasting as a really important fundamental thing that they should be doing. Um, and, you know, I've, I've faced that harsh reality at the coal face, companies going bust. So I think the, the real the real challenge, I think, in gaming as well um, and finance is it's complicated. So you're asking potentially someone who doesn't have the, the skills or experience to kind of look at uh, look at the game development cycle, project that into revenue in the coming years understand the business's costs so fundamentally that they understand having a really accurate read on burn rate, which impacts on your runway. You're taking all those variables into account with revenue being the, the most complex thing. You know, of course it's going to go wrong. You know, this is not about a formula error. This is about making sure that you've got the correct, you know, runway because the entire company's future is kind of based, based on it. So it's, it's really the fundamentals of running a business fundamental to key strategic decision making. And I think it's easy to just take a lens of, I'm just preparing this report. And that's that's not why we're there. We're there to fundamentally provide accurate reporting so that all the stakeholders can make the most informed decisions they possibly can about their studio. And to Angus's point earlier, it's not, this is not about sort of processes or structure or anything like this. this is not about understanding a vision. It's just, in my mind, I define it as providing that value that the value that's really going to drive the studio forward or really going to make sure that we we pick up the early warning signs if, if things aren't going well. I'm curious as well, you know, you're here for a reason. Is there um, a history at the at, at King and elsewhere? You was like you said, oh, wow, you know, this is horrible. Have to fix it. This is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I, I've got to be careful, you know, uh, <laughs> Too openly, I won't have any clients left. <laughs> Here's a cool story about how I think I screwed the entire gaming industry for, for years. Um, and this is one about me, so I can tell it. Okay, so the story as I tell it is is that, um, you know, King Digital Entertainment, um, you know, makers of Candy Crush steaming towards uh, an IPO, right? I'm the guy that's responsible for, you know, uh, or primarily, you know, together with the finance team, um, to, to help do that, that for forecasting, uh, you know, and making sure that we've, you know, we've got a forecast that we've communicated to, you know, our potential investors and, and that, that, that we're, uh, you know, going to hit those targets. Right. Um, in the preceding few quarters, we've been like percentage point accuracy in, in this. So it's like, okay, we know what we're doing. Right. I mean, the, the story with, with King is that we predicted that it was going to be like a $2 billion company um like at the beginning of the year and it ended up being like 1.95 <laughs> like you know in terms of gross bookings right so so super accurate and we were pretty proud of of this process so when we went towards the this this the, this I, ipo the first quarter out um you know uh, we we missed out on our first earnings call we missed our um uh, you know our targets pretty significantly the reason that that happened 
wasn't one of, hey, you know, the game's doing poorly, the game's teams have been doing poorly. What had actually happened is that we started expanding into other countries with lower monetization. Fundamentally, our, our, our mix of users was changing on Candy Crush. And that meant that, that we didn't hit the targets because we had a model which, which basically looked at people, you know, it, it took into account that we were declining, but not as severely as, uh, uh, you know, w w in terms of monetization. And the consequences of that, you know, that won't wipe the billion off, off a market cap, right? For, for what? Forecasting issue. And it meant after that, that people were, you know, and this is a fundamentally new industry at the time, right? Like free to play gaming. Oh, it's a flash in the pan. It'll never last. Well, actually, Candy Crush, what is it, 10, 15 years later, still generating the money that, that, it, that it does. There was no reason to be that nervous, but that act of not being on top of it, not being, you know, not doing what you said it would created, um, you know, not the confidence of investors, you know, not the valuation for, uh, of companies for, for quite a, a long time. Um, and so that's, that's one example uh, of, you know, at a high level of, of, of getting it wrong, right? And that was, you know, something I got wrong, right? And so partly, I guess, the, you know, the rant was like, okay, I'm not, never going to let that happen again. <laughs> what you're saying here is basically, and Hong has said it as well, right? Formula is not the problem. Process is not really the problem. It's more about a framework, having a single source of truth, having something you can rely on. How do you approach that at ramp? How do you make what a bad forecasting process is into a good forecasting outcome? Probably easier for me to just describe what, what I think good looks like, right? The first of all, as we've said before, it's bottom up, it's lever driven. And in this case, in gaming, it should be cohort driven, right? There's no excuses. We're one of the few industries to have, you know, perfect visibility, uh, you know, across all our customers. So we know when they joined, we know what their behavior is over time. Uh, and, you know, cohort based forecasting is you know, clearly the most predictive way of doing this. And to be fair, um, a lot of companies, you know, make a, an attempt at this, even if it's, you know, a poor one, those levers, they need to be uh, levers that you use to optimize the business. It, they need to be the language that the games team speak and everybody speaks within the business. Otherwise, when things go wrong with your forecasts or your model or your financial models, you don't really understand why, right? So you should be able to say at the end of the quarter or whatever, when you're reviewing, hey, you know, we missed because, oh, our, our DAO was down or we didn't have the amount of new installs that, that we thought we would. The model should be decomposable to levers which the games teams and management understand. Because if you don't do that, how are we going to improve? Right? So that's the first thing. Bottom up, lever driven. And those need to be relatively granular, right? So you should be able to decompose it into different customer segments that provide value, right? So the next thing is, is you've always got to start with your best guess, right? We're, we're trying to make an accurate forecast when that's first and foremost, right? What is not great is when you start building in either aspiration or conservatism, uh, in that first pass early in, into the process, because there's some doubt someplace, someone probably will, but everyone kind of needs to agree on, Hey, this is how we're tracking and this is where we're at in a very bottom up, you know, sort of way. Otherwise, you know, you don't have a, ba a basis for agreement on which, which, which to build, build on. And when you do build in, if you want to do that, there's nothing wrong with it, right? We're going to build a stretch target to motivate a games team, right? This is where we want to be. This is how, yeah, it's fine, but make those assumptions explicit. So when you miss, right, it wasn't just how hey, you've done a bad job. Right. It's like you missed the stretch target, but at least, you know, you hit the, <laughs> you hit the, the base. And we haven't done worse. So maybe you just reach too high. That's all. But you know why? Yeah, it's, you know why? Um, it's important that, that, that the input assumptions are, are, are owned by the games teams. You know, they're agreed upon. They're owned by the games, the games teams. Um, I think it's better if it originates from finance because more a neutral arbiter, probably with the skills probably just one step removed from actually working on the, on, on, on the project itself. So they're not, you know, looking through it with rose colored glasses. 
think it's constantly important to be refreshing, you know, because otherwise it's just a bit of paper that sits in a in someone's desk for a quarter, right? This is the budget. We should be okay hard on it, and and we should be refreshing it as possible so we can track our progress against it, and, and, and we should review it so that when we hit the quarter, we understand why we have missed, and so we can improve as a company, but we should also improve the model itself. The, the finance team should be KPI'd on getting better at this because it's one of their most important jobs, right? The last point is, okay, we've got a new game, right? Um, where you don't have a long operating history. You know, we also are in a unique position where the, the, there are great market comps, you know, which you can anchor your, your forecasts in. But, you know, you need to do it in a way which is reasonable. You know, like, hey, you know, oh, our game's going to have the best retention or the best of ever installs. You, you need to assume that you'll win, but, you know, you can't assume that you're the next royal match or, <laughs> you know, by, de by default. and Because otherwise, you know, that's how, you know, mistakes get made. So, so yeah, that, it's kind of what a good for forecasting process to me looks like. Let's talk about how you do that in reality, how you do that at Space Ape Games. I mean, to start off, exposing the truth and the assumptions, the biases, how do you sort of rein all that in? Yeah, so Angus has done a brilliant job of articulating why it's so important to have a single source of truth. We as a finance team, we want to be innovative, but we're a cost base. No one wants their finance team spending any money. Like that's a reality. So it's kind of hard to build a business case to go like, can we invest in tools on the team? Like that's where the last protocol in a, a gaming studio. So um, I think the first bias is like founders and management actually supporting this initiative and understanding that finance needs certain tools that we're really going to drive these, drive this forward. We want to get good. We want to get better. Like that's, that's always there. That's fundamental. Um, so I think here at Space Ape, the one thing that really helped um, me and my team is uh, I call it like the third generation of games, or John, our CEO, talks about third generation of games, where we just got more data driven. So suddenly, just with this lens, it became easier for us to contemplate, hey, how about an automated forecasting tool? So I think that's the first one. Angus also talked about the inherent bias. You're like, I'm a finance guy, so I'm naturally conservative. <laughs> um, CEOs are naturally optimistic. Like, people want to believe what that number may or may not be in their own mind. And you get game teams split where conservative uh, game teams and game leads want to like sandbag and then aggressive game leads and game teams want to push it out there and they're really bullish. Um, so I do like the point Angus made around sort of finance being this objective arbiter. And I think that's, that's kind of key. I genuinely believe finance should lead. Um, at the same time, there's this big collaboration amongst all the different teams because, um, as I said, you've got management, you've got UA teams, you've got analytics, you've got finance, you've got lots of people who are looking at data and forecasting and forming opinions with all their own different perspectives, goals, and objectives. When you kind of mix this all in, if there's no a lack of a single source of truth, with this all cascades down in the team, there's like huge confusion around what the actual number is and you know like um we experience and you know firsthand implementing this tool where you know three or four different teams having a different perspective on what game margin is is a, a you know a fundamental fail and so uh the one way we we overcame that is kind of quite simple is we realized the problem we accepted hey we need one single source of truth historically um that was contained by the data and analytics team but we thought well why not invest in an automated forecasting tool because it does all the heavy lifting for you. It's one single source of truth. And what happened is when we made the decision, because this is based on mathematical modeling and there's a lot of nerds in a game studio, everyone kind of went, okay, yeah, like math is good. So, um, so I think on that premise, once it was shared amongst the teams, what we saw was a cascade of, you know, when I talked about every team has their own goals and outcomes, they just revised and reshaped it around, okay, we have a single source of truth and we can work around this. And so I, you know, surprisingly it was kind of adopted quite quickly and it worked kind of, kind of quite well. Um, and the one thing for me, the true value add, uh, is the fact that 
the finance teams, the analytics teams, because we have smart people who can create their own models. They were now unlocked to actually just do their job. So look for the insights, look at what the data is telling us, and then inform the rest of the company to make sure we can make good commercial decisions based on all this information. For us, it kind of works because, as I said, we're really data-driven. We want to put it central in all of our game development. And for us, having this tool ultimately has kind of helped us in the long run. It's about accepting this as a team, but there's also a benefit or something here to discuss, Angus, around, yes, a single source of truth, but automation. What does automation bring here? What does automation allow? First and foremost, it's, it's time saving. But in terms of the benefit to the actual forecasting process itself, right? You know, if you've got the person who is responsible for doing this forecasting and, and budgeting process, they're spending less time building, updating and QAing modeling. You know, I know firsthand I was up, you know, this was my life, you know, I was in spreadsheet hell until 3 a.m. in the morning doing a presentation with it's for potential investors you know, uh, or trying to secure funding or, or, or so on and so forth. The amount, sheer amount of time that goes into doing that, what that comes at the expense of is actually the most important bit, which is actually questioning the assumptions which go into the model. At the top of the segment, Hong said, your model is only as good as the things that go into it, right? Um, and it's absolutely true, right? So we need you know, the process of questioning that, sense checking it, aligning it with the team, getting them to own it, it, it that's the most important bit. That's the bit where the, the mess ups happen, right? Because usually it's like, okay, that's a model, we're done, right? Let's move on to the, on to the ne next task. Um, so that's the benefit. The quality of the forecasting improves because you're spending more time questioning the inputs. Uh, I, I, that's that's what it's all about. So we've discussed that you need a forecasting framework. You need to understand the input assumptions. You need to build from the bottom up. And automation does help. But hey, you don't get there overnight, Hong, because you know it's trial and error. What was that before you get to that 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 eureka moment, that aha moment that says, you know what, this has to change? Yeah. So uh, frameworks all are well and good. Uh, but I think there has to be the lens of what good looks like. And as a team, do you really want to innovate in this space? Uh, so if I had to say I had like a eureka moment, it, it kind of, I wind back the clock. I once worked at a company called Newton. Uh, it was an ed tech company. They did personalized learning. So the concept was that when you're teaching a subject to a, a kid, based on their learning profile, what's the next bit of content that will help them learn the previous one? Now that was completely powered by AI, machine learning, and predictive models. So I think at a very early stage, I, I believe Newton was ahead of its time. I learned the, the importance of mathematical modeling and how it can really enhance your, your product solution. So I think for me, that was really the, the aha moment. Um, I think in its evolution in, in working in gaming was our founders started speaking to Angus and there's suddenly there was this opportunity to kind of implement an automated forecasting tool with a recently globally launched game, Chrome Valley Customs. And yeah, it was, it's, it was a really uh, collaborative effort. And in terms of sort of what gave us most confidence and, and what the best sort of outcomes were, I, I think from this experience was we, we validated both models. So firstly, our models using the same assumptions kind of gave very similar outputs. So that gave us more confidence as a team in what we did, but it also gave us confidence that the tool was kind of pretty accurate. Um, where, where sort of it goes beyond the framework um, is the average uh, finance professional can't do regression analysis. We can't project out like this forecast beyond the first 12 months generally with relatively, you know, with relative accuracy. So what the software is able to do is project your business over a two, three year period. And suddenly as a company, you can make informed decisions over a longer window. Um, so that's, I think the, I would say the second quite valuable sort of outcome. And then the third one I kind of mentioned already, I call it human curation. I, I used to work in music, so I always think of curation. Um, but basically it's, 
what is the value of a finance team? It's it's not to, as Angus said, to prepare reports. It's actually to create value. So I always think about a finance team trying to find value through insights, through the data, through you know big decisions from the studio. So um, and by having that automated system, it just builds a lot of confidence. Now, if I you know, just to be objective as well, it really requires good assumptions. So the model in isolation doesn't do anything. The technology in isolation doesn't do anything. It requires really good input because it's mathematical modeling. So it just creates an extra degree of confidence and certainty and accuracy around the, uh, around the models, as well as save a lot of time, as I said, for this human creation, uh, for us to uh, gain confidence in the model and then you know finally be able to accurately sort of forecast the business into the future. Angus, human creation at the same time, AI and automation, how does that come together in, in RAMP and how are you maybe building on that? AI uh, is having a profound impact, you know, AI, ML, you know, on, on the core of the business of what we do you know, in gaming content creation. I'm sure that you've had podcasts about, about this. I saw, a, I saw a, a demo the other day, completely no code of someone writing a game saying, okay, now move this, now create a spaceship, now make it move faster, now increase the rate of fire. Absolutely mind blowing, just with, with, with voice. Um, um, and I think th that will extend to you know, other areas, uh, more uh, business re uh, related functions um, of, of the business as well. But I think what's fundamental is that you need to, um, you need to, to, to fully understand why the machines are making the decisions that they're making. Otherwise, you're not going to trust them. It can't be a black box. And that's why, say, at RAMP, you know, it, it's just an algorithmic framework, right? We use ML to have a first pass at some of the assumptions. We round the edges in cer certain areas, but at, at, at the end of the day, inputs and their outputs should be very easily understood, you know, in terms of we pull this lever, we get this out, out the other end. And as long as humans are working in the business, that will always need to need, need to be, be the case. So for example, you know, at rare, we do, do things like use ML to, uh, to simulate seasonality. Right to to examine the past data set and to say, okay, well, we're stronger in the winter and then they are in the summer. Or but the thing is, you understand that because it's visible to you there, right? And you get to eyeball that as a human and say, that looks right to me, right? Um, so so look, it, it, it's going to have you know a profound impact on some some of these things, you know, going going forward. Um, there's no no doubt about that. Um, the other thing about AI ML is like. You know, if you completely let the machines do the decisions, then where's the sense of ownership right, for teams? It's an important process because people need to feel ownership that they're giving a, a give, been given a target that is realistic, achievable, um, and that they're, they're going to have the potential to smash it out of the park. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market in all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz and you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz and that's a wrap until next week. Yeah.